Welcome. We're going to ease into our show here. We are uh, Eat This, Drink That. This is episode three of season two. We are um, so excited to um, have all of our new followers on Fireside. Um, It's great. And uh, it looks like our third host is joining the stage with us finally. So let me get him on here with us. Awesome. So today we're doing testing, this. testing. There One, we go. Two, testing. Here we go. There it is. <laughs> Look at that hat. Yeah, I, I need just a want haircut. to call That's this out right. On. I'm going to call this out right away. Your throwback Thursday high school pick was <laughs> awesome. You were sporting a colorful bow tie in the '90s in high school. That was that's cocky. Well, well, a <laughs> welcome to private school. Let's just oh, get, yeah. get that out of the way. Right. Welcome to private. school. Let's get that a, out of the way. A <laughs> pranking. Um. Yeah, you know it's a What's busy up? kitchen. What's up, dudes? How are you guys? Good. Uh, let me um. Do the thingy. Oh, Lordy. So Ali posted this photo of him uh, the other day where he was, um, you know, a little heavier, let's say, and in his teen years. I know Ali's been doing a a health journey um, this year for everyone. So that was very brave of Ali to post that. Well, uh, it's easy now. It's easy yeah. now. Yeah. Oh. I see what you're saying. <laughs> Well, it's, it's it's fantastic to do now. I was only going to bring up the bow tie. Um, because that in itself was, you know, kind of cocky. Oh my God. I mean, uh, you know, I actually, what's kind of funny is I, what are you doing? He's trying to set up the Facebook. um, Oh my God. This is great. He's setting up the Facebook. I only brought, so for anyone who's tuning in, we have, um, we have broken wine down into very rudimentary categories for white wine, red wine, today's episode, sparkling wine. Uh, and then next week, the season finale of a very brief, uh, quick show, uh, season, we're going to do sweet wines, which is these two are all wine is kind of dear to my heart, but sparkling and dessert wine as a way, it fits into our show because drink better, eat better, experience things that you're not normally doing. Um, it's not your everyday go-to. Um, there's a rabbit hole on both of these, both sparkling. There's always, I mean, there's always a, a rabbit serious hole. rabbit hole. But I only brought six today so that we can spend a little more time. Okay. Still a lot. Chat. Yeah. I want to chat. I want to talk about what sparkling wine is, but I'm going to pass this back to you, Ryan. I was just giving everybody a synopsis while Ali got ready. Yeah. Well, that's our new game, sort of, is seeing Ali try and uh, put the pieces together <laughs> at the beginning of the episode for whatever reason. But uh, it, it is my favorite part of every episode, getting Facebook ready on Ali's computer. It's awesome. Yeah. So, um, you guys, uh, before we get into sparkling wines, I was wondering if you had any memorable food or drink moments or experiences this week between the two of you guys. Oh, damn. Yeah. I'm about to crush that. It looks yeah, cool, it Ollie. looked like you had a bunch, Ali. I already thought of mine, even though mine wasn't last week. Um, but I'll let Ali go. Let Ali go. So, it, this was kind of crazy. So, you know, actually, this was actually through a friend, but from time to time, I'll get like invites through PR companies about some food event, right? Um, right. So, there was this event that happened last night. Um, it, it, it was started, it was, it was, first of all, it's called Meat Carnival. Let's just get that out of the way. Wow. It's called Meat <laughs> Carnival. Um, ironically, you think it's Brazilian, but it was a live fire cooking event, 20 chefs. Orig- uh, the, the creators are two chefs from Israel. And um, I felt like there was this entire theme of like Israel, Middle Eastern, Mediterranean food and live fire cooking. I think they were kind of play, playing up the whole Texas thing. Wow. It was um, not a well-known festival. Uh, my friends who went, some of them were food writers and just, you know, the, the blog influencer world. Um, it was kind of like, we're kind of like 
hey, you're doing this thing. There wasn't really a lot of word or whatever. I had no expectations. To be honest, if the thing went sideways, I'd be like, I'm going home. I'm getting tacos. I don't care. Uh, turned out to be really cool. There was probably, let's call it 10 cooking stations, chefs at each one. And they were just doing all kinds of stuff with live fire. The, the, you didn't have plates. You didn't have utensils. Um, they gave Ow. you like literally like uh, it was a black rag, not this. Uh, it was a black, black little hand, wash towel. And you basically used that to wipe your face and hands as they just kind of handed you food. I oh, mean, wow. I had chefs give me a wad of steak tartare in my no hand. Way. And I just went like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of like eating Indian food. You know, I have you, never heard of that ever. That's like a tartar bump. You know how they do caviar bumps? It's a big thing right now. Yes. That's a yes. Tartar yes. bump. I absolutely <laughs> and I didn't know I, I, I actually had that two years ago at Austin Food and Wine Festival with let's just say a chef who was not, you know, he, he's a bit of a rock star, if you will. You can do the math there. Lots okay. of tattoos. It like Japanese death metal, you know it's a thing, Ryan. You know yeah. it's a thing. Course. Yeah. So, anyways, but yeah, I remember he like put it right there, and I was like, "Okay," um, but but it was urchin, it was caviar and urchin, really. But um, yes, wow. it was like that. It was very kind of like uh, it was like a bacchanal, if you will. Um, and and I'll tell you the most unique dish that I freaking loved. It's kind of crazy. It was basically like a smoked meatloaf. I saw it, and there was a oh. bone jutting out, and I was like, "Oh, did you smoke a beef shank?" No, it was this Turkish thing that's like, you know, if you can imagine gyro and shawarma and stuff, there's going to yeah. be a lot of like um, play on minced meat. So they combined right. beef and lamb. They smoked this thing and then she was just slicing it. And they put the bone in the middle as kind of an effect to make it seem like it was a joint of an animal, but it was basically yes. a smoked meatloaf. It's Turkish in origin, incredible spice profile. I mean, just picture shawarma spice you know like ryan when you're you know getting that zanku and you get the edges the edges are oh, like yeah. chicken, and you the get edges that are the best and not yeah. that yeah the edges are yeah i made it for the edges that's what <laughs> this was just redolent in in this ground i mean this ain't just like you know meatloaf's usually like onion and ketchup this was wild stuff right. but um yeah that was that was my eat this all my clothes reek of smoke no I way my jacket outside i gotta wash everything but uh, it was pretty cool. It's called Meat Carnival. I think they'll be doing some tours, but it was cool. Is this a uh, festival every year? I mean, I think they just started doing it. Like, okay. I think they just, you know, like, I, I, I literally, it was like kind of barely marketed. Um, hmm. it, it was put together. I was doing dry January, so I didn't care, but they ran out of red wine. It ain't cheap either. This thing was like two twenty five a person for Ooh, all no you way. can eat and drink. I mean, it's all you can eat and drink. All you can eat and drink. Okay, but that's a whoa, okay. that's a price tag. Can Let's talk market. about the wines. Did so you I'm look at what the wines were? Was it garbage? You know what? I was a not exactly wanting to quote get tempted. You know what I mean? Like right, they yeah. had like a cool bar <laughs> station or whatever. I personally didn't even. think think about them having anything quote interesting you know what i mean yeah. Yeah. i just i i kind of assume honestly i was just like i, I it's work because you know all the, the problem with these festivals here's my hot take on food festivals you spend a lot of money right yeah. for this experience right mm -hmm. basically they take away the service aspect of dining out yeah you're mm -hmm. waiting you know what I mean? You're, you 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 run the risk of stuff running out, which they don't even give you a plate. They put it in your hand and make you wipe your hand. Which which that part I think. Look, I, I'll argue interesting, this. Interesting though. They, they did a beer. If you look at my reels, they did a beer can chicken. Mm. The best time to ever eat roast chicken, roast turkey is right at the cutting board. This entire meal was eating at a cutting board. And okay. as a guy who likes to grill meat all the time, the best bites I'll ever give you are from a cutting board. So that was actually right. its strength, believe okay. it or not. I, I would do that again. But at the same time, it is like kind of, um, these events are just like, I, you know, it, it, it's almost as bad as like people chasing molecular gastronomy in 2006. It's like, yeah. I'm bored eating my french italian and sushi rotation 
kind of yeah, true. You know what else, too? You start seeing, like, the worst behaviors in humans, too, which is, like, they start cutting in line or they start taking too many portions or they get hammered and they're just hammered. falling all over themselves. Hammered. Yeah. Yes to all of that. It, yeah. it really is. It is. It is like the, you know, part of it is because of the lack of cutlery and plates. It was, like... <laughs> Civilization has ended. This is Mad Max with meat. So the it first actually thing I is thought on of. brand. <laughs> but at Austin Food and Wine, it is kind of like, did that lady elbow me? Yeah. In her Gucci? I think yeah. her purse heard that Gucci just like. <laughs> I, I'm stunned. Ollie, I'm you should, out. Ollie, I, you should launch a. Uh, and they're like, uh, you know, this is a tasting. And I was like, oh, anyways. That's another story. I was going to say, Ali, you should launch a truly dystopian uh, food festival in, in Austin. You know, just. Yes. <laughs> I mean, the lack of plates and, and cutlery made me think of animals. Oh, my God. <coughs> just straight animals. It, it, I, I will promise you this. If Hold you on. had the bites of what I had delivered, yeah. <laughs> you would definitely be. I'll say, to me, highest compliment, and it's obviously to a degree of difficulty, the highest compliment for me is like, I'm stealing this recipe. You know what I oh, mean? Yeah. Now mm -hmm. that, there's limits. You know what I mean? I'm barely considering doing my own hamburger buns next week. So, you know, I have limits to what I'm going to actually attempt to pull off. Okay. But, um, it, 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 you know, like, you know, I, I and I think this has been around. I don't know if you guys heard about, like, say, Zahab or Sh it was Shia. The original chef left in New Orleans, but mm -hmm. there's definitely been a, an awakening, uh, recognition of Israeli cooking yeah. and fine dining, and it's really fantastic because you get these flavors of the Middle East. You get the diaspora of Jewish people all over the world who then mm -hmm. end up living in Israel because Israeli food is is a bit cosmopolitan by nature of. Yeah the spread of jewish people all over so there's a lot of great add that plus like super smoky meat at one mm -hmm. point i we were downwind of a fire thing and i was like i gotta get out of here and we were outdoors and i was over right. by smoke my clothes wow were. yeah i love cool. i mean that whole region lebanese food um it's so it's good. amazing good yeah, rose great, Lebanon, Ali. right they have a great one well the Bacana most, Valley. Yeah, the most famous is Chateau Moussard, um, that always has a hint of Brett Britannomyces, so it tastes really gamey and earthy and like dirty. Um, they are the most famous winery, in, one of the most famous in the world, but for sure the most famous in Lebanon. I'm gonna regret asking this. <laughs> Brian's gonna be like, we are trying to move forward. But what is Brettamice? And let's just call it Brett because I probably mispronounced it already. Yeah, so it's just it's another yeast strain, but it's a it's an angry yeast strain. It's cool. Kind of it's famous in Chateauneuf to Pop. It provides oh, yeah. very gamey uh, off flavors, and in the right amount. I've been to wineries in the Rhone. This one in particular in Rostow. That was basically the kid is I've making had that. I've had Ross Stout. Oh, so good. But yeah. he's making wine in his garage. And you look up and there's just microorganisms everywhere. Hygiene what do you mean was, you look up? What are you, Ant-Man? In, in the bar. In the bar. Are you no, no. this? Cross you can just see it. it. You can what see it. There was so much know. in the air because hygiene was not how he made how he made wine. It just I'm not buying thing. any of this. Yeah. It's called microorganism. <laughs> you need a microscope. <laughs> no. You can no. see that. You can just, oh, it's a big cloud of white. Just oh this. God. It was just collecting and collecting and collecting. All well, open top. Yeah. Open top wood for minors. You're an unbeliever to like, I'm troubled. You were in a guy's <laughs> garage. He was cooking stuff up. There was a lot of white everywhere, and you saw yeah. microorganisms. Yeah, yeah. I think we can connect some dots. I think Steve went Breaking Bad. Let's. We gotta move on. <laughs> well, we'll go to mine. We'll go to mine. All right, let's go to Steve because it's a, a segue too. I'm not cheating by saying this. Um, it is over a week ago, but since this is the first time we're talking about this, I gotta. It's still stuck in my mind. Yeah. 
I love champagne. We'll talk about that a little bit more. I buy it. I keep it. I age it. This was a small grower producer called Lermondier Bernier. Very small. Been with a few different importers. I sold it two different times, actually. Two different importers. It was a rosé, brute rosé. Oh, okay. They make it Signe method. So the same method as they make Provence rosé, where they leave the skins on for a little bit, six, right. seven hours, bleed it off. Signe means bleeding. You bleed it off, and then your juice is already lightly colored, and then you start the process. Most champagne houses, I'm not going to say all or the majority, but most, blend in red wine for their rosé. They just take an already made red wine, they blend it in, you get a little more color control that way. This particular Brut Rosé was just blood red. It was darker. Wow. But I've had it since 2014. Um, so it was a 2013 release, 2014 release. Um, we're at eight years in the cellar. This thing was, when I brought it to the group, it's champagne group, the one girl screamed because she knew what it was and she was just oh, like, wow. holy crap. Um, wow. It was the champagne of the night. It was perfect. Absolutely perfect. Wow. I couldn't stop just sipping it. Was it's the color the still there? It still looked like... Color was still blood red. But like a see-through, see-through blood red. Hey, Steve, I'm so glad you brought this up because when I was uh, I was at the store yesterday, I, I posted a picture of some sparkling wines. Yep. I was at a deli in um, in South, South Orange County. But anyways, I was there and I saw rosés. I saw a lot of rosés and I was like, oh, we haven't covered that yet. Uh, we I haven't. Don't with, and so I was, uh, I, I, my curiosity was piqued. So I'm glad you brought up a rosé. Now, now rosés are not always sparkling. No, no, they're, they're dry. dry. The most right. famous is Provence, down by right. Saint Tropez, down on the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. They take all the grapes like Grenache and Syrah, and Mouvedre and Senso, and all these you know Mediterranean varietals, and lightly let the skins touch them for about six, seven, eight hours and bleed it off. Every country makes a rosé. Mm -hmm. They make a sparkling wine. Um, they, I'd be hard pressed to not find a country that doesn't make one of each. The color and the varietal differ in rosé around the world. So there's no wanting, rules, there's no rules to call something a rosé necessarily other than um, the color? Yeah, there's a rule for calling it Cote de Provence. It has to okay. be within this little uh, limited area. Um, the most famous for Americans is, come on, which one? White Zin. White Zin. Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's I was going to bring it up. I was yeah. going to be that guy. Yeah. Well, that was another thing I saw yesterday when I was shopping. I saw Zinfandel, not White Zin, but I saw yeah. Zinfandel, and, and I, yeah. that was another topic we haven't That's really bomb. discussed. Yeah, we really, uh, this is why we so broke, much. this is why we broke wine down into very There's simple so much. categories. Yeah. We could spend a whole year, 52 weeks, 52 episodes, talking about wine and breaking it down. Um, that's how much, that's why I think wine is so fascinating and why everybody really is intimidated by it and drawn to it at the same time. Yeah. Because when you dive in a little, just a smidge, like Ali with Roan, um, Rostow, Jingendas, Chateauneuf de Pop, you really find your way and you're like, holy crap, I'm going to go with this for a while. Uh, Ali's Thanksgiving wine was this amazing burgundy. I think it was a Savigny Le Bon. Um, that rabbit hole, I swear to God, you can yeah. spend all your life savings and just whole fascination with chasing the perfect burgundy. Chasing and mine was like, Seriously, it was like $45 at a yeah. state store in Pennsylvania. And I mean, it's hard because I didn't have it as a cocktail wine, but it was so, it was gone like that. Oh, like really? It, yeah, dude. Yeah. I mean, we decanted it for maybe an hour ish or so. I don't know. Nothing, nothing super crazy. Not all day. Right. So smooth, so good. Like, it just, I almost didn't open the second wine because I was like, I think I wine peaked. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. Because I was all set for number two. 
I had a yep. good Merlot too. Yeah. Even the, the, um, the crazy part goodness. when Burgundy is at its perfect spot in the bottle, because it gets very pissy. I mean, it gets a little angry. You know, it'll get bottled. It'll go through like some sort of shell shock. Um, it'll tighten up. It doesn't matter how long you leave it in the canner. It will not open. It will be mad. But when it hits its right perfect point and you decan it and it opens, it's not, nothing. And that nothing. can only happen with aging in the bottle. Oh, yeah, a little. I mean, you can buy a cheaper burgundy that it's not really going to develop. Uh, it's going to be okay right away. You can drink it like $20, $30. Uh, just, you know, if we talk about our pyramids again, that bottom level of the pyramid, your base, that's the easiest burgundies to buy. They're inexpensive. There's more of it because it's not from this tiny little vineyard. Um, and you can just open and drink it. But when you get into the villages like yours, and the Premier A crew, um, you want a little bottle age. You want to let it rest and relax and kind of get back into its skin. Um, hey, Steve, when you said that the wine was pissy, I thought you were referring to it flavor-wise, but you no, were no, saying, no, it, just you were saying it with an attitude. It's angry at yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, it, gets, it okay. gets upset. Pinot okay. gets upset. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to go out there. I, I, it, it's one thing to say, like, this tastes like human urine. You know what I mean? There's that. But I think more closer to the the idea of something being like, look, I mean, I, this is this is what always shook me about French wine, you know, is especially the stuff that's like kind of expensive and basically people tell you, this is so good. Is I'd sit, it would all, it's all started with Bordeaux for me. I'm like, this, ugh, this, this, this is, it is, it is like piss. It's, it's not enjoyable. You know right. what I mean? It's not enjoyable unless I have like a wad full of brie in my mouth or my mm. mouth is awash in some sort of fat. Yep. Does that cutting, bitter, abrasive nature of those wines somehow become nice. like in very enjoyable then? Yeah, you know what great I mean? insight. Which is totally why the experience of wine and champagne, we're going to talk about this here shortly, sparkling wine, let's call it sparkling wine, uh, and dessert wine. When you go out and you have, you know, an old fashioned somewhere, it's normally going to taste like the old fashioned you had at another restaurant the week before. That's and the damn truth. Make it home. That's the damn truth. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I mean, it's a, you're not going to remember that one time you went to dinner and said that was the pinnacle of old fashions down the road in your memories. You just you're going to remember, remember the bad ones. Yeah, you know you'll I mean? remember the bad one, one that was like, oh, uh, dude, was this pre matched yeah. yeah, but you will remember when you have a wine that was just at its yeah perfect peak. Yeah, and you'll remember it. It will change the experience of the evening, the dinner, uh, whatever you're doing. You will remember that. That's why wine is there's just it's infinite expressions, infinite experiences. Um, just don't be intimidated. Find a little wine shop. Speaking of sparkling wine. Yeah. Can be very, very intimidating. Um, only because the two big horses kind of rule the race, Prosecco, Champagne. And mind you, Champagne blew up during the pandemic. Okay. People decided, oh, I'm not spending a whole lot of money. So I'm going to buy 50, 60, $150 Champagnes. Like champagne no. specifically or sparkling wine or champagne, champagne specifically. Champagne so from specifically. the champagne region. Wow. Which, you know, goes, the prices can go from 25 on the shelf to $300 on the shelf. Um, and there is a distinct difference as you keep going up in quality. Um, the winery Don Perignon, uh, they almost ran out of wine during the pandemic wow. because it takes eight years to make it and everybody drank it. They just keep kept drinking Dom at home. So wait, champagne takes eight years to make. Not always, Dom. but for that one, Generally. for Dom Perignon, eight years. I for a Tete no Cuvée, it's eight years. Wow, okay. That explains um, the cost. We'll talk about this in a minute, but the champagne that one of them, uh, harvest from 15, went into bottle for aging July of 2016 and disgorged uh in 2020 so this was four years in bottle um 
What champagne so, is that, by the way? Is that your first bottle, Steve, that you're showing no, us? No, no, this is Charton Taille. I've had this for, I think, two years now. I'm okay. debating. I don't think I'm going to open it yet. You know um, what's interesting about that bottle? It doesn't, except for that top, except for that foily top, it don't look like champagne. Champagne usually has, like, kind of, it's like a brighter, you yeah. know what I mean? Kind of goldy. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm mean, thinking like Vuv or whatever, yeah. Dom, Moet. It's like kind of like it looks like I mean, it looks you know, luxurious, like a, like a like a tacky birthday card. If you yeah. will. well, that's a broad category, but <laughs> yeah. you know, like an anniversary card. It looks yeah. like an anniversary card. Here's some like precious gold metal. leaf around it. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? That looks like red wine, but yeah. you're like, wait, huh? You know? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, we'll get to it. I mean, in full disclosure, you guys know I work for Moet and Chandel and Puff Get out. Um, end the yeah. show. Yeah, you're done. This is an ad. This yeah, is you're an done. ad. Yeah. Uh, we're not talking about those champagnes right, today. Right. Let's I, jump no. in. Let's do it, Steve. Yeah. Let's, get, so, let's get into it. Let's talk about two. I'm going to break it down simply into two ways to make champagne or sparkling wine. You have to get bubbles of CO2 to get absorbed into the liquid itself mm -hmm. some way so that it has effervescence. You can do the Osti method or Charmant method. It's a tank method where everything goes into a sealed tank. And the so let's first do you get bubbles? Well, you see from, Osti in the bottle of uh, on the yeah, bottom yeah. of. I've never realized what that word meant until now. Yeah. Okay, cool. I got a Moscato de Asti today. Um, you, the bubbles come from sugar being consumed by yeast. And the byproduct is heat and CO2. And if it's sealed and the CO2 can't go anywhere, it's got to be absorbed into the liquid. So you have the tank or the bottle method. Tank method, Asti method, uh, which is how Prosecco is made too. Okay. Everything goes into a sealed tank with the yeast and the sugar. Everything's eaten. Boom, you got bubbles, lighter bubbles. Um, and they're more kind of separate from the liquid. They're, they're not elegant. Um, but they're easy to, to make. They're cheaper. Um, and that's, that's one method. So that's okay. the tank method. The traditional champagne method that was developed in champagne um, you have to, in order to call something champagne outside of Russia, they don't believe in following intellectual property rules in Russia. So they <laughs> literally have local produced, still, champagne. you know, sparkling wine that just says champagne on it. They don't okay. care. Um, but the rest of the world does. Has to come from this little area of champagne, 45 minutes east of Paris. Um, these are in bottle. So this bottle is the same bottle that they put in 2016 in July. They put in some liquid, they put the um, triage, the sugar and the yeast in there, wow. they capped it and they laid it sur lot for four years. Didn't move, just sat there underneath the ground in the creers, in the cellars, um, didn't move and developed. So you're developing a few things bubbles. Also the dead yeast, I think it's like probably four or six months. Everything is consumed. The yeast falls to the bottom, sits right here. Mm -hmm. um, that adds flavor. So biscuity, yeasty, brioche flavors called autolytic. Um, it's the same process as fire and meat called the Maillard process. Same exact process. Um, real, but that's yeah. Meat. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Same process. Um, you're adding flavor to this. The longer it sits in that bottle, sir, lot, you're going to get more flavor. Um, this is four years. Uh, the laws for a brute for a non-vintage are twelve months, then another three months in bottle. Uh, for a vintage, it's thirty-six months that it has to age. Okay. Um, but almost every house now because you're getting more money champagne is a big deal every house is chasing a better product um so they're all aging for much longer um in the case like dom perignon it's eight years it's a lot eight years doesn't doesn't move um i brought examples of both i wanted to bring more because this is a category that 
this should be a part of your weekly rotation, to be honest, some form. Um, Cause it's that good. And it just enhances everything. It enhances the people. Everybody loves champagne and sparkling wine. Method Champenois or the champagne method is used all around the world. Um, they just can't call it that. Um, right. So those two methods. So we're going to start with tank method. Um, the cheap stuff, if you will. Yeah. So let's go through prices real quick. Moscato di Asti, $14. This cool pet nat from California from the Cruise Wine Company. Really weird grape that I'll tell you about. This is the most expensive of these three. It's $38. Okay. My personal favorite in this category is Lambrusco. Um, mm. Dry Lambrusco. Quality Lambrusco. Not jug Lambrusco from crappy, you know, just, we're not drinking crap. This is no, Don't good. drink from the jug, Steve says. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I just, um, this is only $17. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about this. Moscato di Asti is from Asti. The method is Asti. Um, the grape is Moscato. So very floral, pretty, grapey. Um, they press it. They ferment. They stop the fermentation. Throw everything into a tank. Um, you get a light amount of bubbles. This is only 5% alcohol. Seriously? 5%. It's oh it. Oh, my God. So technically... That is a reduced or low alcohol. I think the Bureau of Alcohol and Firearms, you know, the the legislative body of the U.S., I think it is seven or eight is a reduced alcohol wine. So that's the level. This is only five, so it falls in that category. Budweiser um, levels, folks. Yeah. Budweiser levels. It's only um, two atmospheres of pressure. So what that means is champagne – is six, um, which roughly comes out to about uh, 90 PSI. So your tire is, your car tire is 30. Right. Um, mm -hmm. This is three times that. That's a lot of pressure in that bottle. That cork is always wanting to come out. Um, this is a third of that. So it's lightly fizzy. Okay. So you start the meal with this. Um, it's only 5% alcohol. Everybody gets a little glass. They get to Everybody relax. Everybody gets a bottle. Yeah. Hey, Steve, bottle. Can, I, can I clarify? So this is the, um, Moscato was like a popular wine, I feel like, five or ten years ago. This is not Moscato, is it? It's just the yeah, grape. Yeah, yeah, same, same grape. It's from the Muscat family. Uh, Muscat grapes are very floral, very pretty, um, very grapey is a good expression of that okay. um, Moscato family. Um, it is. It is that. Okay. Um, Just wanted to clarify. Yeah. And from cool. this area, there's another one made from Moscato uh, called Asti Spumanti that has a little more alcohol, a little more bubbles. Um, and are these on the sweeter side on yes. the taste? Okay. 120 grams per liter. Oh. Yeah. Of sugar. Yeah, sugar. Yeah. So I think Moscato was, was definitely trendy about five or 10 years ago. And, and, you know, people were like, how can you drink that sweet, yeah. low alcohol? Yeah. But I think that's the point is it's, it's like almost like a soda or something, right? Yeah. You can drink it, a lot of it. Yep. Yeah. It is still very popular. Um, yeah. A lot of people's entry into wine comes through Moscato de Asti. Um, <laughs> Prosecco is sweet too. So, I wanted someone to bring this up. I, I did not bring finger. Prosecco. Did you feel that finger? I was like. <laughs> <laughs> I did not bring Prosecco today. It does not need help. Okay. Um, Prosecco is probably, I'm guessing it's number one, way above champagne. Um, Prosecco well, it's is. cheap and it's good. I mean, you yeah. know, you drink it and you, don't, you drink a $15 bottle and you're like, right on. We're yeah. keeping it classy. You know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's Close it's to the fun. same. Close to the same, but a little more floral and pretty than a Prosecco. So that's the move. So our eat, eat this, drink that. Like, this is the Steve move. He's like, you're probably reaching for the Prosecco. You should be reaching for yeah. the Muscadet. Yeah, it's 5% five, 5 alcohol. Um, I know that's a big thing right now. Low alcohol, no alcohol wines. Um and there's methods that you can actually reduce or take out all the alcohol out of a wine. Yeah. 
this is a natural method. Oh, cool. um, you're not going to sit around and drink whole bottles of this. It's a little sweeter. You want to have it maybe with a starter. Um, mm. Don't forget about like charcuterie plates and stuff like that with a Moscato. It's a lot of fun. Cheeses um, right at the beginning of the evening. Steve, what do you think about the drinks that sort of like say a mimosa or something where you're mixing in another component to sort of dilute it or? So that was my whole point about Prosecco. If you have ever gone to brunch and had a Bellini or a mimosa, you have drank Prosecco. Yeah. Um, by itself, it's not very good. And we're talking like $4 bottles of wine. Right. Um, it might cost the restaurant two fifty. dollars yeah. Um, something like that. So it's easy to blend in your nectar or your orange juice and just, it's easy. You don't have yeah. to think about it. The acid from the juice and this kind of sweet, uh, effervescent, uh, Prosecco, it's perfect. But within Prosecco, there's a higher level that is actually very, very good. Um, it's called Conegliano Val de Beyondine. It's a long phrase. If you just see Val de Beyondine, on the label, it's coming from a higher DOC, a higher category of quality. Okay. Still using the same grape, Galera, but it's just made better. Okay. Um, so that's one idea for Prosecco. You can also go over to the home of Italian champagne is called Francia Corta. Um, they, they will use Chard and Pinot. They also make some really fun sparkling wine. Um, we'll talk more about that in a little right. bit with, uh, champagne, but this, there's a whole, we've done natural wine on a show before. You've yeah. heard me talk about it before. Natural wine is no sulfites, limited intervention. You're not touching anything. You're just letting God and the greats and nature do its thing. Um, there's a category within there that has blown up, um, that I actually love. It's called Pet, P-E-T, Nat, N-A-T, Petiolt Natural. Um, everything just happens in the bottle. So you're fermenting over here and you decide I'm done. It still has sugar left. You pour it in the bottle. You put a bottle cap on it and it keeps fizzing in the bottle because the yeast isn't done eating the sugar. Uh -huh. um, so that was kind of the original, the ancestral method of getting bubbles into uh, wine. Um this is from Napa Valley. This guy, Cruz Wine Company, makes a whole bunch of different uh, pet nets. He uses an Austrian grape varietal called Saint Laurent. Um, this is Val de Guy, which I'll tell you about in a minute. He also makes a very high-end California champagne method sparkling from his winery called Ultramarine. I've had two vintages of this. Uh, they're very, very good. And single vineyards, I think, they're $200 a bottle. True. Uh, yeah. They're not cheap. Yeah. And there's a waiting list to even get them. So, yeah. yeah. Kind of like um, that. Is. Small, small quantities and all that. So, back a long time ago, they started bringing Gamay over to the U.S. into California to grow and make wine. Gamay is just nice and soft and fruity. We talked about that last week on we our did. episode. Okay, cool. We did. Um, but a long time ago, before DNA, um, nurseries technically sometimes didn't know what they had. It happens a lot. Down in Chile, they thought it was Sauvignon Blanc, and it turned out to be a completely different grape. I'll wait for him to come back. Hey, just so you know, uh, I have to hunk down on cough drops because I've had a cold all week, and uh, my throat's really dry. So if you see me chugging water and recola. Right. While we wait for all these, uh, Steve just mentioned we have a natural wine episode, and you guys can find that on Spotify and yeah. other um, streaming podcast sites. You can also find the natural wine episode on our YouTube page. So please go subscribe to our YouTube page. Um, it's eat this, drink that. Um, just look it up, and we do have a natural wine episode. Type natural wine in there. That should be the name of the episode. I think it's somewhere yeah. in the 40s or late 30s. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Now that was all, fun episode too. We dove down a full rabbit hole of crazy. Um, <laughs> so back to Gamay. So they bring all this stuff over. They think it's the Gamay grape from Beaujolais in Burgundy. And it turns out 
A lot of it was Valdegui. This grape came from the Languedoc, down towards the Mediterranean, Marseille, and along that whole Mediterranean coast. <clears throat> a lot of people just kept it, switched the name. There's wineries making Valdegui single varietal red wines. This guy does this beautiful pet nat. There's a jamminess to it. It's a little lower in alcohol. This is 11%, by the way. Okay. It's a little more expensive. It's $38. Um, it's worth it. Nice. He's, and you can find these a little bit more. He's not producing tiny little amounts. So what bottle are we on so far out of the series? Are we on? We're the jumping into number three. Number three. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So we're going Lambrusco. Okay. Lambrusco is from the area around Bologna in Italy. So central, south of uh, Milano, a little bit northeast of Florence. Emilia Romagna. Uh, and the Po River Valley is like the Monterey of Italy. They just grow. It's a perfect, fertile landscape. They grow a lot of their fruits and vegetables. They also grow Lambrusco. Okay. A bunch of different grape varietals can be used, but this is um, Lambrusco Salamino, 100%. It's only 11% alcohol, 12 grams per liter. That's it. Okay. But it's the Rosso. So they have Rosso, they have Rosado, so they even have Blanco. This has just this beautiful, pure fruit profile of raspberries. The best, I think, pizza wine, period, is mm. Lambrusco. I will tell you something. I had Lambrusco at a wine tasting <laughs> at a great store in LA called Silver Lake Wine. I yeah. hate it. I hated it. I was like, what, what is this stuff? It's gross. I'm drinking Welch's soda. I don't care. I'm not interested. <laughs> Cut to, I don't know, 2018, many, many years later, at the restaurant I've talked about so much, Bufalina Pizza. The whole point was they created this Neapolitan pizza menu to go with this wine collector's wine list, right? Oh. We got a Lambrusco. I was like, meh, meh. <laughs> I guess, man, they're like, it's really good. I'm like, okay, fine. And I'm already eating pizza that ain't Joe's late night pepperoni slice. I wasn't even signing off on eating margaritas at this point. Okay. Right. Two things happened. I freaking completely fell for um, basically at the time weird pizza, a.k.a. Neapolitan margaritas, not pepperoni sausage. Pepperoni. Pies. Right, right, right. And that Lambrusco was freaking delish. I went yeah. for lunch. It was a daytime wine. It was awesome with pizza. And when mm -hmm. I saw that on the list, I was like, damn, I wish I saved my pie for that. Yeah. Genius stuff. Yeah. Cool. Um, this is really my outside of champagne. I'll drink this more than anything. Cut Nats and Lambrusco. Um, they're not adding a whole lot to this. There's Very no, cool. you know, it's in that category of natural wine. It is just so good. And when you go to a store, you have to go to the coast where most of the really good Lambrusco is. Um, there's one called Opera that I can never find. It's, it's They just don't make that much. It's amazing. There's also sweetness levels in this. Um, this is a drier one. It's 12 grams per liter. Slightly above what Brut is. So Brut is roughly 6 to 12 grams per liter. Most champagne is somewhere around eight, nine, ten. Steve, let me ask a uh, a dumb question. Maybe it's not dumb, but do bottles of champagne tell you how much sugar is in there? Is it on the no. label? No, I'm okay. so glad you bring this point up. Jeez, Ryan, using what the, the heck, man? I think now this guy does, but he doesn't give us the residual sugar. I mean, if he I saw it. there was a, a Moscato that had 120 grams of sugar in it, I'm not buying that wine. And my, 120, yep. I, but how I are we supposed to know that? Do we got to go to the I'm website? I'm on like, do I really want to jack myself up? You know? Yeah. Like, I, you have to search it out. Okay. I am of the firm belief that wine labels should have nutritional information on Yes. It. The fight's been going on for a while. Huh. Um, what they should do they should do a QRC code on it. That would be the ultimate modern yeah. solution. Yeah. Just put a little box on the bottom of your label so we can get the nutritional info. People All actually wine labels care. should be QRC. It should be unreadable <laughs> and just
just make us live on tap. Just yeah. holding our phones to every bottle. Yeah. I'm just a grocery store clerk. <laughs> <laughs> All should, this fight has been going on for a while. I think every wine label should have additives. Um, and you could even go to spirits too, because they add caramel to brown spirits. They add yeah. things to mask over inferior product. Sure. You should have sugar information, calorie information. Uh, like everything. where you buy the grapes from. Yeah, yeah. A lot of, yeah. The nutritional information should be on these wine labels. We're consuming it. Um, this guy puts some. He tells us how many bottles, 2,000 bottles. Tells us the vineyard, the region, all that stuff. There's some laws governing this. You can get some quality definitions through um, – the laws protected in France and Germany and Italy and all over Europe. Uh, you can follow producers that you know are just making better product. But for the casual person, that stuff should be on the bottle. It really should. So I'm glad you brought that up. What about bottle four? Are we moving on to bottle four yet? Or yeah, no? so let's go to our new method. So those three, okay. tank method, or, you know, in theory, there's different method in there. But um, you're creating the bubbles in a different environment. These are all in the same bottle that was aged in the cellar. So Cava is your kind of go-to non-champagne, champagne method. Um, but I mean, Argentina makes um, method champenois. Uh, California, Australia. I really looked for two that I couldn't find in Denver. Tasmania in Australia is okay. making amazing chard, pinot, and sparkling wine. Wow. It's a little more expensive because it's from Tasmania, but, you know, 40 bucks, you can get a really good Tasmania sparkler that is so interesting and so delicious. Uh, the other one is English sparklers down along the coast. I never um, think about England and wine. Yeah. yeah, they're saying that I think England's uh, climate is changing in a, in a fashion that they're producing a lot more wine than they used to be able to. Yep. You yeah. couldn't get the grapes ripened before. Yeah. Now with global warming, I mean, it is we, wine and chocolate and tea and coffee are the canaries in the coal mine, period. Um, they grow in areas where climate change is changing this environment so drastically that southern England – can grow grapes, yeah. ripen them fully, and make sparkling wine that is stunningly delicious. It is not cheap. I'll just tell you now, it is not cheap. <laughs> like what? Um, uh, 50, but it's over 50 a bottle? Yeah, over, over 50. Yeah. yeah, over 50. You can easily spend 75 to 100. Is that because of the volume issue? They just yeah, don't make it. Volume. They make it yeah, work. they just it's not like they're doing some crazy quality stuff. It's yeah. just, they're not pumping them out. It is still high quality, so they have less space to really do it. So you can't do volume to make up your money. You have to do high quality uh, with the oh, limited amount of volume. Oh, yeah. I see, I see. Yeah. You got to create value somewhere in your product. If you're growing grapes out in the Central Valley in California, you're growing a lot and at high yields, you don't have to worry about quality. You're getting enough grapes to make all your money back. Um, if it's a very small, limited area, you have to raise the price. And because of that, you have to just make better wine. So they're making very, very good stuff in England. I looked all over, couldn't okay. find them here. I could have gone out to like Boulder Wine Merchant or something, more of a psalm driven geeky wine shop. Um, they probably had them. I just didn't go out there. What, so, did you, what did you find? Let's see it. I got two champagnes from my cellar, one that I'm getting ready to open for our next champagne group. And then Cava is just the easy. Man, this is $10.50. Wow. Um, they have some local varietals that are crazy, Peralta, um, uh, Zarello, and then Macabeo. Macabeo is another synonym for Macabeo is Viura. That's what they make um, white Rioja with. So same grape. Um, same method. I think that's in Cava, you only have to age for nine months. Some people, you can buy expensive Cava that was aged for three years, but I mean, why? Um, go with it's, it's 
spend 10 to $15. It's aged nine months. It gets a really nice texture. It's not as fine and luxurious and just elegant as champagne, but it's just drinkable. Cava yeah. is just Cava is a, a pretty well-known uh, side sparkling wine, would you say? It's pretty big. Cava. Yeah. yeah, I want to say it's number three. It's Prosecco, then good in champagne. A yeah, I see it more in restaurants and bars, but, you know, basically the Cava and the Prosecco are – you know, the more affordable things and the champagne's like crazy expensive on the wine list. You know yeah. what I mean? So like, yeah, yeah. I know. And what's kind of funny is I, uh, maybe it's because of the character issue, but like, I, I like it dry. I mean, Prosecco, orange juice, whatever, different story. But to me, Cava has always been like, I like this. I don't need that champagne. Like Cava always hits it for me. It hit, you know, yeah. it hits straight up. Yeah. So I couldn't find the, Sugar on this. I looked. It's See, a brute. That's horrible. It's horrible. It's a brute. You can't that out. So you're yeah. probably under. This is a really cheap cava, by the way. So the importer and I couldn't even find the winery. Um, no website for the winery. The oh, importer I, had about as much information as you needed. A suspect to, now. Yeah. And that ten dollar um, thing. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know about so that. So you're not really finding a whole lot of info. No info. On this. Doesn't yeah. exist on the web. Yeah. Who's making um, this wine? Charles Shaw? What's going on? Yes. Here? Bingo. <laughs> so this is uh, only 11.5% alcohol. We're also okay. not talking a lot of alcohol. So we're not sitting drinking a 16% Zinfandel um, okay. from California. Um, we're drinking something light, soft, effervescent, easily drinkable. I'm going to grab one more champagne to show you something. Ali, did you have food stuff to go over today? We're running so late that I want to make yes, sure. Yes, that... I do. I absolutely do. All right. Um, Let's start checking so, some of that out, if you don't mind. I yeah, yeah, because the, the next next three are all champagne, so this is a good interlude. Okay. We'll work with that. So, yeah, yeah. let's keep pumping. Let's keep pumping. Oh, no, you can talk food. This is a nice break for food before we dive in straight yeah. through champagne. Okay. So I'll just say this. Um, you know, like I – um. Champagne's a funny wine to me because it's expensive. I, I have limited experience with it. I drink it fast. I love it in the morning. And uh, I love it uh, with as a mimosa or whatever. Um, yeah. To me, day drinking, brunch, and I think one of the great ways to experience all this stuff is something kind of on the more comfort food end. So, gentlemen, I present to you the Lox and yes. Bagel. I think lox and bagel is a great way to either get into, you know, maybe, maybe it is. I mean, look, if, if you're geeking out, I'm limited, but like, if you have a good champagne, why not have lox and bagel? Uh, when I was searching for um, foods to pair with champagne, smoked salmon topped the list. Yep. And, um, you know, this is fire. Wait, I hate using that term, but I'm, <laughs> I'm surrendering to it. You know, this stuff and a, freaking mimosa is game over like yeah i almost think like sometimes with brunch you know it is you know it's like wasn't it breakfast versus brunch is diner food versus paying more money but there are certain things that really kind of go okay this really feels like brunch and i feel like this is the brunch sandwich if you will um is it an everything is, bagel or what what kind of bagel is it so this was the thing i'm okay. so glad you brought that up part of me and this is a question for steve so i this is from Nervous Charlie's here in Austin. Austin is not New York City when it comes to bagels, but there are there are some spots. Nervous Charlie's is is one of the better bagel sandwich operations in town. Um, the big choice I had was not lox. I knew it was going to be lox. I did it with red onion, capers, and cream cheese. The question was what I wanted to put on the bagel, and part of me was like, well, I'd have to defer with Steve. I went with Poppy. I Poppy, love okay. everything, yeah, yeah, everything seasoned bagels, but the problem is, is would that create more problems? Those spices and all that, mm -hmm. and that you know, the garlic and the onion, I just wasn't sure. So mm -hmm. I went with Poppy because, it, it pop, look, Poppy seeds like this, it adds a little depth of flavor, but it's not offensive. It's not going like, right. to get in the way of too much, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Use you. Yeah. So that's what I went. Wow, and then uh, plain cream cheese, or is there any flavor in the cream cheese? I went, dude. You know, I, I, yeah. I'll tell you for me, the 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 peak, the mountaintop of this is uh, Russ and Daughters in New York City, the appetizer store in the Lower East Side. Um, I don't get too weird with it. Um, really, it's about the locks, you know. And this ain't yeah. that kind of locks. 
But yeah. uh, actually, no. That's great. My my favorite bagel shop is in um, L.A. It's in it's Virgil Village, but it's technically Los Feliz. It's on Hillhurst. I think it's Hillhurst, right up from Squirrel. I don't even know the name of it. It's just Montreal Bagels. Well, that's um, a different style. Yes, oh. totally different style. There's a line on Saturdays and Sundays. The line forms, and I've been in this line at 6 a.m. Um, where you're uh, number called, four. Uh, It's called Courage Bagels, I guess. Yes, I Courage. That's yeah. it. Okay. I mean, I am not joking. Just heard about that. They Just heard about are that. ridiculous. Before I moved, um, they opened maybe in 2019, but, and they were open like two days a week. Then it was three. They might be seven. Um, there's still a line. When I was there, um, last time I was there, I had to stand in line, um, like at 7 a.m. Yeah, it's, it's working it. like they're open four days a week only and 7 to 2 p.m. Unbelievable bagels. I mean, oh, it's cool. this is kind of the whole home run for me of just like everyday food. Over in Atwater, you got the best breakfast burrito ever at Via Corona. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, Papa Chorizo, come on. Legendary. That's a tall statement. That's a big statement. <laughs> we would have some other places. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to take you to the land of Burbank, bro. Yeah. You come through and you go oh, to uh, Burgers Never Say Die over uh, by Silver Lake Wine. Um, yeah. Then come through Los Feliz and you got Yuccas for tacos. And then... Yeah. I actually like the burger there. Yeah, the burger's so, very know, good. I'm going to do this for my last food bit and then we can kind of rock through the rest, yeah, yeah. rest of the come lines. On. But okay. I want to say this. One of the things I first learned, uh, I did a tasting menu years ago, and we, and you know, at the time, and it's still true, my wife really she she's more white wine rosé. I love red wine, and we were like, well, what do we do? You know, what's the best wine to have? And this is the first time it was told to me. They're like, go with champagne, go sparkling. They're like, it goes with everything. Everything it goes with everything, and that was one of the most interesting things um, about champagne in general. And it was kind of hard for me to kind of. Well, I mean, that's so broad. Well, everything kind of goes with it. But to me, like, if you're kind of dipping your toes in it, I think it's just rad to have it. it it's, I think it's the ultimate day drinking booze. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. I think champagne is the ultimate day drinking booze, whether you do the um, Mosa Bellini route. But, um, and then have yourself a freaking lox and bagel and you're chill. You can go, you can go to work. Dare I yeah. say, you could do, for sure, a Mimosa, but, <laughs> Have like a glass of champagne, have a lox and bagel done. It's twelve percent alcohol. That's it. You can drink these you at lunch. Still go to work. <laughs> you go work. I'm thinking day drinking is Saturday, Sunday. Ollie's like, yeah, day drinking, bagel. You can still go to work. Yeah, you can still go to work. <laughs> you bring up a work. really good point. Champagne gotcha. goes with everything. Everything. Um, you can end a whole evening with like a really heavier, richer, oxidative style champagne. You can start the evening with a Blanc de Blanc, something racy and Chardonnay driven and really linear and that acid and can come through. You can have it with charcuterie plates. You can have it with whole fish sampler plates. You can eat with fish, chicken. Um, you can even drink champagne with heavier meats like pork and steak. Um, mm. You don't... You don't really need to. I mean, you, yeah. you don't have to drink champagne from the beginning to the end of a meal. Um, but if you wanted to, you could. Because the range of styles in champagne is pretty extraordinary. You got three grapes. Munet, which is your fruity grape. You get, And it's also called Pinot Munet. Um, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Chardonnay is the racy, apple side. Pinot is the cherry structure, kind of shouldery. It's got a little, I'll call it tannins, but they're not really tannins. Um, get a little more structure from that. This actually happens to be crazily, because the vintage, it will change on what they blend it with. Um, they have Chardonnay and Pinot. This is 100% Pinot. Um, this Whoa. has got a little more strength and power to it. So they have um, to take all the skins off, yes? Yes. So, okay. great point. Um, in Champagne, because it's so strictly protected, you have this government group or trade group called the CIVC that governs everything. They tell people the harvest date, so you get enough sugars in the grapes. Um, the 
original method of champagne, it's so far north, you couldn't always get these grapes to ripen. You had higher acidity. So you wanted almost something without a lot of flavor and more acid, because you're going to add the flavor through the process of making champagne. So you pick a little bit early, but the CIVC wants to make sure you're not picking stupid early um, and your quality is better. Uh, they also govern how to press. And there was a guy, a real person named Dom Perignon, that came up with how to press black grapes without getting color. Because in a brute, you have no color. This is clear. Um, but it came from Pinot Noir, which is a black grape. Mm. But the juice in all the grapes is clear. You right. only get color when they are touching the skins. Yeah. yeah. That guy, Mr. Don Perignon, came up with how to press without getting color. And that's how the CIVC governs. They make sure how much you press, how much juice you can get out of it. Because when you press... The early juice, the free run juice is always better than the second and third press. Um, so they govern all of that. Um, then you do a blend. So you have the, so let's say winery A brought in their Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Munet from 2022. They have all that, they made their wine. So you still make wine initially. Mm -hmm. um, then you separate it up. You can blend in, it's a non-vintage. So you're blending in older vintages. So some people might have stuff that goes back 20 years. Most people have one and two or three year reserves. So you store the wine somewhere else, you blend in some of the current vintage, then you blend in a little bit of 2021, a little bit of 2020, and a little bit of 2019. You blend that whole thing based on your house style if you're a Pinot house, you're going to have more Pinot. You're going to have more structure and oomph and cherry. Is this only a champagne thing then? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, other countries and wineries mimic this, but not to this degree. Okay. But um, only a sparkling wine thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a spark for a champagne method. There's other okay. wine. That ultramarine, I mean, that guy does vintage, only one vintage. He doesn't blend in reserve wines. But okay. plenty of Napa sparkling producers blend in reserve wines. So it's using a, grapes from different years is for yeah. a sparkling wine. Yeah, method. yeah. Yep. Got it. Um, yep. This happens to be, I realized that I didn't even bring a non-vintage. These are both vintage wines. Um, but so, so say which, you're- Which ones are we talking about right now? What are the names of the ones so we're talking about? So Charton Taillet. Okay. And De Marique. But you cannot find this anymore. It's gone. They sold this whole Yeah, store. that looks there's, expensive. Look at that. There's the classic label. label that we were talking about earlier, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for rich people. How this much is, does that cost? This is from right my uh, seller. Okay. I just decided I'm going to open this. Um, what year is this? 1999. Whoa. I've had this for um, 15 years. How much does that cost? How much, that, that how one, much have I bought it right now? At the time, it was one forty. You can't right now. Yo, you can't buy this. I oh, can't buy this. Can't um, buy it. No, I just I brought it out because I'm like, holy crap! I got one bottle left. Spitball. I had a, Spitball. I, had a, I had a six pack of this, and I drank it. You know, over the years, this is my last bottle. But these are both vintage. So you have non-vintage champagne. You're putting your blends together. You got your house style. You got your big boys. You got your Moet and Chandon, Vub Clicquot. They have house styles, um, Piper Heidsick, Charles Heidsick. Those are the houses. Okay. Then you have the growers, the people actually growing the grapes that the houses will buy from. That movement really started late 90s, early aughts. Um, there's a couple importers that were bringing, they were the first to really bring in grower producers uh, that Champagne that I talked about I had two weeks ago is a grower producer. It's been with two different importers. I've sold it for both. Um, Charton Taille is one of the first to really be brought in. It was the first grower producer I fell in love with. Um, my parents always thought I should be, I should do something important, not <laughs> sell wine, until they came to my champagne dinner that I did. And this is back in 2004. Um, I put a whole grower producer 
dinner together. We had champagne all night. Um, I presented, I talked about champagne. I shared why it's important, why you should, you should drink champagne every week. Yeah. Um, and my, I will never forget my mother like a week later, like, you know, I thought what you did was kind of bullshit. Um, <laughs> until, until I went to that dinner. Wow. Um, that's she so said, cool. that was really cool. Um, what did you eat? I know it's going to be yada yada this house. I, was gonna I, gonna I don't remember that. the menu. What were the foods? I don't remember. The, it was at a um, cool American kind of bistro place, really funky on the inside. Had a uh -huh. <clears throat> really whacked. Um, they had a actually a theater upstairs that a bunch of local and traveling musicians played at. That was brilliant. Um, and the restaurant was just eclectic. It had sounds rando dolls and you know that kind of thing oh, it was okay. american cuisine um so chicken and fishes and well, just classic american cuisine steve what do you what do you like to eat with your champagne what do you like it with that's maybe that's a better question so that uh champagne group that got together <laughs> two weeks ago um, yeah the champagne group that got together two weeks ago um we had caviar Two different kinds of caviar. I think one was U.S. and one was somewhere else. Um, caviar. That, that's the best thing. Sushi. <laughs> so there's a sushi Ooh. place I go to in Little Tokyo. Um, I just forgot the name because I'm a little headspace from this cold. That's okay. Um, I always bring champagne. They will let you bring your own in. The last bottle of this that I drank was down at this sushi place. And what kind of sushi? Do you get all the sushi or do you have a, a I sushi? usually just let Chef um, just here. Just so I'm going to just throw me. this out there. What, I mean, what what really makes it work? Like, is it, I mean, because it's honestly, let's be honest, soy and wasabi to a degree drive the strongest flavors you're getting from a sushi experience. Yeah. It's the acid. So that's, the acid. that's what makes it work. Yeah. The acid. I mean, think about all those. Sauce. Yeah. The fatty the fishes. Um, right. And Steve, that acid. Do you, do you put a lot of wasabi and soy on your sushi? No. Okay. See, there no, now I, we're, we're getting somewhere here because you're yeah. you're you're thinking of champagne and sushi, so you you don't want to put too much soy and wasabi. So it is, you know what it is? It's all subtle, delicate. I yes. think that's kind of the thing. Is like you have this thing. You could almost argue like, you know, that's the problem with drinking old fashions and even having a steak. When you're having whiskey, dude, you're numbing this, you know? Like, yeah. you almost, you might as well have a bunch of old fashions and go to a, a mid-level steakhouse, you know what I mean? Right. But if you're having, like, that Wagyu A5, Wagyu gets thrown out a lot, but if you're having something that's, like, so Real. stupid good on Instagram, you know what I mean? It looks stupid good on Instagram. If it's a croissant, if it's butter, if it's, like, kind of these, like, beautiful, delicate flavors, you want to make sure you're not fucking it up with right. something in your face ketchup or like, oh ketchup. i just got cracked in the nose dude kind of yeah. drink right you yeah. want to go to the sushi place that gets mad at you for eat there's no soy they they don't put a thing of soy out on the yeah. counter I just I had this sauce. thought this week, and I don't, I'm so glad it came up that you have sushi with champagne because i was sitting there going why am i putting wasabi and soy on this Unless it's just horrible and I need to mask the flavor. Yeah. But like, if it's good sushi, why even do you it? You need like, just you know, a just a hint. Just a like ugh. Yeah. 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 And so sushi, you know, caviar. You know sushi, um, you're gonna spend 150 bucks a person. I mean, right. just just know that you're gonna do that. Um yeah. for really high quality sushi. You let them just kinda say, Yeah, you know, you tell chef, you sit at this sushi counter. You share a glass with your sushi chef. This is um, omakase, we call this, yes? Yeah, but it's not like you don't walk in and just say omakase. You just <laughs> walk in and you say, hey, chef, you know, chef's whatever. Choice. Yeah, chef's choice. Um, this is what I like. Uh, bring it. And you eat until you can't move. That Or I do. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, it's just. And 150 is a bargain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 150, yeah, you can creep into 200. Asanebo is another one over in the valley um, there in Studio City. That's sure. really good. Um, so I had so the, the last bottle that I drank, it was, I, 
I have a few champagne groups. Um, this one was back in LA. Everybody would just bring champagne and we'd meet down in Little Tokyo. There's a cool mm. bar wow. two doors down that you have to wait in. It's a weird, like they have a lot of different Chinese spirit. Um, it's a weird, weird bar. Red velvet everywhere. The bar sits really low. Um, you go in and have a cocktail or two while you're waiting. They buzz you to come over because there's no, you can't make reservations. You just show up and you're going to wait for an hour and a half. Um, then you're going to hopefully get to sit at the counter with the chef and you bring your champagne and everybody shares whatever they, they brought and people aren't bringing crap. You're, you wouldn't be in the group for very long if you bought, you know, some <laughs> crappy entry That's level so champagne. Oh, you're out of the champagne group. Yeah, yeah, this is a hundred bucks. Be. I'm like eating a lox and bagel, like dreaming of sushi. It's it's a yeah. I'm getting kicked out of the. the yeah, this Ollie, is after bucks. you brought bagels last week, we are kicking you out of the group. Yes, Ollie. you're out. Oh, no. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a uh, hundred dollars. Charton Taille. Hundred bucks. This is a single vineyard. This is so. This guy is pretty good about um, all the info. It still doesn't give you nutritional value, but tells you the parcel, tells you uh, the vintage, the village, the bottling. So this is really important. There's stages for champagne. What vintage? How much reserve wine is in that bottle? Is it 30% or is it 70? Were they aged in oak or were they aged in stainless while they sat around waiting to become a part of a blend? Um, was it a single vintage? So a vintage wine, what vintage? There's great vintages. There's also just good vintages. Um, this is 100% Pinot Noir. When was it disgorged? So it's sitting around like this. And if you have a champagne house that doesn't tell you how long it aged or doesn't give you the disgorgement date, just don't drink it. There's no oh. reason to. Okay. Um, this sat Sir Lot on its side with all the dead yeast. Getting better, 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 bubble, bubble, bubble. Um, disgorgement is the day that they got rid of the dead yeast and then put in the dosage at the end. Dosage on this is extra brute. This is four grams per liter. So they actually put in a little sugar right before they ship it out to you. Um, it's called uh, dosage. But you have to disgorge. You got to get rid of all the dead yeast. The time from when it goes in the bottle to disgorgement is how long it aged. The longer, the better. Um, this is four years for Charton Taille. And how much is that? That was 100. Okay. They do four different single vineyards. They also do the regular non-vintage Brut Cuvée Saint Anne. Charton Taille is one of my all-time favorites. There are a ton of grower producers now being brought into the U.S., not all of them are good. Okay. Um, I love the, the ones Tasmania, are... Tasmania and England tip. I would have never thought about Tasmania. I know. I know. Sparkling. That weird. English, whatever. That sounds it's not cool. like, you know, fuller. I want to be mindful of our time, you guys. Yeah. We're, we're, well, this we're is gonna... the last one. Last okay. one. Let's talk about Catherine de' Medici from De Marique, uh, former Queen of England or uh, Queen of France. That's who. This is named after, I mean, this house sold. This was a grower producer called De Marique. Um, this was their Tete de Cuvée. So quality pyramid. You got non-vintage down here, house styles. Everybody has their own house style. Then you have vintage. So uh, yeah, just vintage champagne. Mm -hmm. Every house does one. Then you have Tete de Cuvées. This is the very best very from that house. Very top. Okay. Best bottling. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be a single vintage, um, but it's usually aged for a long time. This was aged, I believe, for 10 years, Sir Lot. So even longer than Dom Perignon. When I bought this, I think in 08, no, it would have been it's 99, would have been 2010 or 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, I bought a six pack, 140 a bottle at that time. This is gone. Um, 
but I've decided oh, uh, it's time to open this. This is also, there's another couple little tips. This has more to do with pricing of the grapes to protect the growers, but you have all these different villages, but you have villages that are rated Premier Cru and Grand Cru because they do have better ripening conditions back when they put this together. They wanted to make sure the people that owned in the better villages got more money for what they grew. So okay. you have Grand Cru at the top, uh, Premier Cru, and then all the other stuff. This is Grand Cru from a Grand Cru village. 50-50 um, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Sir Lot, 10 years. And I have now aged this. Um, let's let's put this together. Would have been to scored somewhere mm -hmm. around 2010, released, sent out, probably bought it in 2011. Uh, so, yeah, 13 Steve, years. Steve, what's the, occasion, years. what's the occasion you're going to be opening this for? Yeah, this what do you mean? Uh, 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 I already sent this to the Champagne Group saying. Oh, the Champagne after, Group. Yeah, that's right. After you um, that Lermondier Bernier Rosé, I mean, it was so freaking good yeah that, now I my uh i'm excited about champagne again i want to open some really good stuff i got more in in my locker well what do you I'm just with that open. well we'll probably do the same so there were a lot of there were fresh oysters um Ooh. fresh uh fishes different smoked fishes um smoked fish, two nice. different kinds of caviar and uh Was first time i'm shucking them there then yeah 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 one guy's there husband. That, one girl's you know, husband whoever, was, that's who you want in your champagne yeah, group. Yeah, yeah. Someone who can, because that's not easy. Uh, you'll take no. your thumb out. Yeah, I hey, don't do it. Steve, um, so did you join a champagne group while you were in Denver? Is that what happened? No, like, these are through all my – the only people I know here are in the industry. Okay, that's um, why I was curious. Yeah. So okay. my close friends have friends who are also in the industry, and they kind of had this – champagne group that gets together and drink champagne. And I showed up with the wine that made everybody scream. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. 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 So I've already reached out and sent the photo and said, I just decided what I'm opening for the next one. Um, so hopefully here in a couple of weeks, I'm on the road for a little while. So I want to kind of like nail this because, you know, this is, you know, to me, when you have something really, really expensive, you've been sitting on it for a long time, that adds value, of course, too. I just want to kind of nail this. Oysters, uh, I think yeah. you said caviar. You yeah. said smoked fishes. Did you just say like cooked fishes too? What well, what else is on? Well, there? you That's could, true. but no. You know, if you're champagne to me, shouts. Everybody sitting around, hanging out, <coughs> talking. Uh -huh. So more finger food, small bites, right? yeah. small bites, right? Small bites. Yeah. Cooking up a bunch of fishes and just throwing them on the table doesn't really yeah. shout small bites. Yeah. Okay. Got it, got it, got it. But smoked fishes, and you can go to a Whole Foods now, and they have all kinds of smoked so. fishes. Um, if you scallops. were to sit down at a restaurant, though, and use that, I mean, would you even? I mean, I understand in a group setting, sure, but like at a if, restaurant or whatever. If I was still in L.A., this I, I brought this sushi. bottle to sushi restaurants a couple sushi. times. That's yeah. cool. So still something like... Delicate. So that, that, Delicate. that seems to be the theme here, right, guys? It's yeah. like with like a proper – what do you, what did you call top of the pyramid again? So uh, Tete Cuvée. Okay. Tete, tu, tete Cuvée Omakase Sushi. Straight up. Yeah. Period. Yeah, yeah. Nice. There's – I mean, if you're going to go out. Remember a long time ago we did one of our first – it was definitely first season. Um, and Ali's food choice that week was Subtle Foods. Yeah, that's um, right. And, and kind of arguing. Yeah, he was arguing against <laughs> subtle foods. Dumb. Yeah. But the most important subtle food, period, is sushi. Okay. And champagne just enhance, enhances sushi perfectly. Cool. I, I got to say, because, you know, look, caviar is like, man, that's a lot. You know, caviar makes sushi look reasonable. Let's just yeah, say yeah. that right now from yeah. a price standpoint, right? Yeah. I mean, at least sushi like involves like a starch for Christ's sake. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> oh, wait, yeah, let me pause you for one second. Because the person that brought one of the tins of caviar also brought grilled baby potatoes cut instead of bellinis. 
they were putting, we were putting the caviar on little tiny grilled potatoes and it was awesome. Wow. Um, I never would have thought you can literally just put it on your finger and eat it. Um, People talk about potato chips, right? Potato chips and champagne just to throw, putting caviar in a potato chip, which I've had, which is kind of cool. Actually, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, I would argue a good potato chip is better than a car's plain white cracker. Maybe the pepper oh, yeah. is better. You yes. know what I mean? Hey, so think got- about this too. Any sort of cheese plates, triple crims, very creamy cheeses, um, stinky cheeses, blue cheeses, and champagne go really well. Especially if you go into a oxidative style of champagne where they stored it in oak barrels for a long time and it becomes denser and richer and more um more the flavors are just so amazing in an oxidative style with a lot of reserve wine added to it um Mm -hmm. with a bunch of cheeses yeah but cheese is kind of like this i mean if i had a freaking 300 hundred dollar bottle of freaking something something yeah. I, I just want to go all in. You know what I mean? Like Sushi. Sushi. After you eat cheese, you're going to be like, now what? But if yeah. you didn't know Mikasa, that should be yeah, yeah. that. So I'm sick. It's the best. It's the best. Champagne and uh, sushi. Very oh, good right. sushi. You're not I mean, eating right. California rolls. There, I think With that's the, it. I mean, I feel like that, we've Champagne and sushi. <laughs> Period. Yeah, it's done. Cool, you guys. What do you, let's, uh, let's wrap this one up. What do you think? We, uh. We uh, have this is probably our longest fireside episode at this point. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, we had fun. We had fun going in. <clears throat> it's a deep yeah. one. Steve is gonna go freaky on wine. Let's just get that out the way. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean. And this was only with six. But I will say, I mean, I, like I said, I could just drink kava and be done with it, and I'd have a lox and bagel. But I'm absolutely intrigued because I'll tell you. You know, the, the first thought you have with sushi, fancy sushi, is like sake. Sake yeah. goes down too fast. At least yeah. the champagne's got some bubble that's going to slow this train down. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm calling it. Like, I'm yeah. champagne and sushi. I'm, I, that, next time we do an omakase, I'm going to bring a bottle of champagne. Yeah, sushi. yeah. Really good champagne. Boom. Yeah. yeah, let's recap. I mean, Moscato de Asti instead of Prosecco. Um, start looking for pet gnats. Um, there's plenty of natural wine producers doing pet nats. Um, Lambrusco and pizza will change your whole life. Um, cava, instead of chugging uh, mimosas, why do that? And then very, very good champagne. You can do grower producer. You can do houses. Everybody is making extraordinary champagne now. Um, global warming is also allowing a little more ripening. And amazing sushi. This is the perfect pairing. Um, Thank so you I only did six wines this week. Just forewarned for next week. Uh-huh. I went down a serious rabbit hole. I spent a lot of money. Um, we got 10 dessert wines next week. Jesus and, Christ. And I mean, I'm filling up. I'm getting all rabbit holes filled up by a uh, by a contractor. This is outrageous. <laughs> Basically, there'll be no more questions to wine ever. As soon yeah. as you see, this. no, no there, there will be. It'll just it's over. There so no next week we got we got dessert wine next week on uh, Fireside same time same channel eleven Pacific two Eastern PM two PM Eastern. Um, it'll be episode four next week. Yeah. Hey, let's uh, do a quick shout out just to say welcome, Chris. Chris joined. He's here every week. Yeah, it's great to see him. And let's remind everyone, too, that uh, I think the richest man in the world uh, sells champagne. So this is important to know. Yes. Yeah, seriously. (laughs) And we might know someone that's affiliated. But anyway. And and don't buy champagne from Russia. It's a scam. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys. Guys, it's great to see you. Have a great Saturday. Thank you, guys.